Angela, I promise to love you unconditionally. I promise to forgive you unconditionally no matter what happens. I promise to point you to Christ, making him the center of our marriage. I promise that I will seek Christ myself and overflow from his love and example into our marriage. I promise to have eyes only for you as the love of my life. I promise to pursue your, pursue your heart and to take the time to show my affection for you. I promise to bear my heart to you, to be honest with you and to confide in you. I promise to hold your hand, to laugh with you and to treasure you. I promise to die to myself to serve you. I promise to sacrifice for your good and the good of our marriage. I promise to put in the work to make our marriage strong and tend it like a garden and that I will take leadership to set the direction we need to go. I promise to listen to you and care for you, to comfort you and to support you. I promise to remind you of the promises of God to sustain you through hardship. I promise to walk by your side on the good days and especially on your bad days. I promise all these things knowing that I fall short, so I promise to ask for forgiveness when I fail, get back up and start again. I promise that until the day I die, you will be my love, my friend, my confidant, and my companion, and that I will never leave you or forsake you as long as I live. For you, James. I once heard that life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. This is true, but I have also heard that those who put their trust in Christ can still have a hope not knowing what's inside the box because Christ has filled it. And indeed, we rest secure knowing we lack no good flavors. <laughs> With Christ, we lack no good thing. He bestows blessings upon blessings, and yet we deserve none of it. You, James, are my sweetest blessing here on earth. I entrusted my future to the Lord's sovereign hand, and behold, a box of chocolates filled with rich and glorious things. <laughs> James, with you is where my heart feels at peace. I never knew a person could feel so much like home. You've seen my darkest days and nights, and have offered yours, your hands, and embraced to comfort me. You sing songs over me and lovingly pray over me without question, answering my phone calls, at 1 a.m. or coming to visit me for just five minutes to give me a hug when I need it. You've been there for the silliest too, eating pickles out of a jar in Target makeup aisle. <laughs> James, I love you because you're selfless, without hesitation. You're always slow to speak even when I am not. The way you reflect Christ's love and grace towards me, or how patient you are and how kind your soul is and can be seen from a mile away. I love you because I see your heart. I see how it longs for the things of God and I know your dad would wholeheartedly agree. I promise James to always seek to put Christ first in our marriage and to honor him, to encourage your soul to walk in remembrance of the promises of God, to help you turn your eyes upon the grace and love that flows ever so richly from the cross. I cannot wait to show off Christ and his steadfast, unfailing love through our marriage. I love you. I love you too. Love God, oh, it chases me down. 
Well, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Her mother and I. Amen. You guys can turn and face me right here. Yeah. Well, we want to welcome everyone as we gather this afternoon in the sight of God whom the Bible describes as holy, 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 and we're here to witness a ceremony honoring this holy institution of marriage. And James and Angela believe that God desires for them to be married, to no longer live alone, but to become one. And this is glorious because marriage is not an invention of man, but this is what God has created Marriage between one man and one woman according to His divine purpose. And the Bible says what God brings together, not to let man separate. And so James and Angela, your marriage is primarily for the purpose of honoring God. Right? It was created uh, by God and ultimately for His glory. And the rest of us are gathered here today to witness this joyous occasion, to witness them make vows between one another. And something fundamental is really going to change today. The Bible says in Genesis 2, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And so this is an incredible gift. Um, and James, in this gift, this picture of the gospel represents the Lord Jesus Christ as he seeks to lovingly, sacrificially lead his wife. And Angela represents the church Christ's people in loving submission to her husband. And so let's open in a word of prayer right now. Let's pray. Well, Father, Lord, I thank You for this exciting day and bringing these two together. Lord, what a joy it is to be a part of this and to see all that You've done in their lives to bring them to this moment. And Father, we greatly desire that James and Angela, as they embrace this covenant of marriage together, and make these commitments today, Lord, that You would be honored and glorified both today and as long as they both shall live. 
And Lord, we pray the gospel would clearly be seen in their marriage and may this marriage preach the glorious reality of Christ and the church to anybody who is willing to watch it. And so, Lord, we thank you for everything you're about to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This couple desires for me to pass on to you an invite to another upcoming wedding. And it's one that they're both going to be in attendance at. I'm going to be there as well. And this is the most important save the date that all of us will ever have. And more than that, you don't want to go to this wedding and find that you were unprepared. Think for a moment about a few of the groups and how they respond. And ask yourself, which, which group do you fall into? The first group, the Jews, they got the invite and their response was, we won't come. They ignored the feast altogether because they thought they had found another way. They kind of viewed the invite as a scam. Is something that wasn't genuine. They didn't believe Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. They thought there's going to be another way. The second group, they viewed the king's royal invite as unimportant. You know, they were indifferent to it. They got it in the mail, and they thought, this doesn't really include me. And it said they paid no attention, and they went off. One to his farm, another to his business. I mean, this is a royal invite. How could you respond like that? You get a royal invite and you go, you go to your farm? It doesn't add up, right? I mean, imagine if James and Angela asked someone who was invited to this wedding, and they didn't make it today, and weeks from now they run into the person and they say, why didn't you guys attend our wedding? And the person says, well, I was busy playing video games and my favorite TV show was on, so I couldn't make it to your wedding. I think that would be offensive to them. But we're talking about people rejecting an invite to what wedding? The wedding of the Lord's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, ouch, how much more when you reject the very one who created you and gives you breath? Then you had a third group. The third group responded in outright hatred towards Jesus Christ. It says they seized his servants. They treated them shamefully, and they killed them. And that's, that's what happened to the prophets that, that came. They kept getting killed, and people thought, well, we can kill the prophets, and it's not going to be any risk to us to snub the king in such a manner and reject him. Because he's not really a powerful king anyways. If we kill his messengers, there's not going to be any consequence. But Jesus says in Matthew 22, he sent out troops to destroy those people. And so you realize there, this is something serious to consider. So what, what has been your response? There's a fourth group. This is the group that I hope all of us will find ourselves in. The fourth group is those who actually attend this wedding ceremony. They don't ignore the invite. They actually attend. But we're going to find there's something more than just attending it that matters. In verse 10, it mentioned they gathered all who they found, the good, the evil, and the good. And so that's, that's a picture of the gospel call. Jesus invites sinners. He invites the good. That's the self-righteous who think they're good. He invites them all to come to Himself. And so who makes up this group of people who comes? It's people willing to identify with the King. And we could think about it this way. It's those professing to be Christians. They have a profession that they know Jesus Christ. They're willing to come to identify at this wedding. And yet, what did we notice there in the parable? The king actually comes out and he examines all of the guests. He's trained, and he finds a man who doesn't have a garment on. And so this shows us not everyone who professes to know the king and comes to the wedding, truly does know the king. And they don't have what he said was a wedding garment. And so let's think of that for a moment, because that's important detail. On the invite that we have to this wedding ceremony, it, it says we need to have a garment. We need to have certain wedding clothes on. And so what is that? You can think of it like this. It's like a badge, right? When you go to a conference, you got to have a badge while attending the conference. It marks you. And there are realities that are true of you 
that the badge indicates you belong there and there's something that's really actually true of you. And so this wedding garment doesn't really just signify one thing about the person who's there, but the king is looking at everything about this person to see do they belong. But there's two crucial aspects of what this garment is and what it represents that I want to think about. Two things. The first is this, and this is so essential. The first thing I believe this wedding garment points to and symbolizes is that it is something provided by Jesus Christ for you, the sinner. I think before we think of the garment, we have to think about our need for something to clothe us because mankind is dead in their sin. All of us, apart from Christ, are under the judgment of God. The same holy God who's bringing these two together in marriage He's holy, holy, holy. He's perfect, and get this, God demands perfection. People love the statement, no, no perfect people, there's no perfect people, but friend, we have a problem. God demands perfection in order to go to heaven. And that's a problem because none of us have perfection. And so all of us are in trouble but there is good news. There's one man who lived on this earth and he lived a perfect life and he did have perfection. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Son of this King. So I plead with y'all, don't reject to attend this wedding. And don't reject to be prepared for it by trusting in Jesus Christ. He will give you those garments absolutely for free. He's prepared everything for you and I. It doesn't matter how evil you are. If you trust in Jesus Christ, His blood will wash away all of your sin. And the Spirit of God will make you a new person and give you power over sin. This is what Christ has come to do. And it's a glorious message. Well, amen. Well, we're not at that wedding ceremony yet. So you got time to think about that. But we are at this wedding ceremony right now. And so we've got a feast that's going to happen inside. So let's go ahead and have the wedding party. Come back up here. And we're going to get these two married. You've got a new responsibility. A responsibility that you've never had before. You're to love her with self-sacrifice as Christ loves, loves His church. Your love is not to know any sort of limit or end. You're her provider, her protector. To this point, I've witnessed for over a decade, Ken and Annette seek to care for her and provide for her, and they're worried about her when they lay in bed. Well, now all that's going to be on you. <laughs> and you're going to seek to protect and provide for her the rest of your life. And Angela, James is about to be your husband. And you're going to joyfully, by the grace of God, seek to submit to him, trust him, follow his leadership. You're making a choice today that James will be your provider, that James will be your protector, and that you're to love him by the way of submitting to his leadership, supporting him, caring for him, and loving him by being the complement that God wants you to be. And this is all happening in the sight of God today. And James, God's designed marriage to be between one man and one woman, and He has designed it to be permanent for us both as you shall live. Well, James, I'm going to read these vows and then ask you to say, I do, and commit to them. James, do you commit this day in the sight of God to take Angela to be your wife according to God's holy ordinance of marriage? to nourish and cherish her, to honor and protect her in trial, in joy, in sickness, and in health, to lead her in the truth, being her appointed head, striving to not be harsh, but to live in an understanding way with her as the weaker vessel, to leave father and mother, forsaking all others, to cleave to this one woman alone, and in all to strive to love her, as Christ loved the church, seeking the glory of God, of God above all things until death parts you. I do. Amen. Angela, 
Do you commit this day before your Father in heaven, the Almighty God, to take James as your husband, to reverence and love him, to submit to him as unto the Lord, to help and to care for him in trial and in joy, in sickness and in health, to forsake all others and cleave to him alone in love, to do him good and not harm all the days that God gives you both in your life, seeking the glory of God, above all things, until death parts you. I do. They both said I do, if you couldn't hear it. So. <laughs> well, let's get the rings. Or, you go ahead, James, and grab hers. Don't put it on her yet. Well, the ring is a token of your love and affection and dedication to Angela. It's a seal of a sacred commitment you're making whenever you see this ring on her finger. It's a reminder that you've committed before God to love her and to cleave to her alone as your wife. Now go ahead and place it on her finger. And repeat after me. Angela, with this ring. Angela, with this ring. I'm declaring to God and to all the world. I'm declaring to God and to all the world that I take you to be my wife. That I take you to be my wife. Angela, you can grab that. May the ring you place on James's finger remind you of the commitment you're making to respect James, to love him above all others, second only to Christ. Let's go ahead and place it on his finger. And repeat after me. James, with this ring. James, with this ring. I am declaring to God and to all the world. I'm declaring to God and all the world. That I take you. That I take you. To be my husband. To be my husband. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, uh, Lord, I thank you for these two. And Lord, even just the vows that have been exchanged and the truth that these two are committing to. Lord, we pray for these two as witnesses here today. Lord, that we would continue to love and support them, Lord, as a couple. And Father, would You use this couple for Your glory? Oh, Lord, we pray that, Father. That Lord, two are better than one. And here You've brought them together, the two, and You're making them one. And so, Lord, I thank You for these two. Lord, would You bless them in every way? Would You continue to make them like Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that these vows will never be broken. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, James and Angela, you have vowed before God. You vowed before these witnesses sitting here today. Therefore, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss your bride.
Um, over the last few months, I've thought about giving a speech today, and I've had the thought many times that some things are just hard to put into a few words. James and I spent a lot of time together, whether he was climbing into my crib so we could jump on the mattress together or planning a hike for us to go on an adventure. He's always been there, and that says a lot about him as a person. So last summer, as I was driving down a back road for work, I got a call from James, and I had that uncanny feeling, I better answer, and it turned out that he was engaged to Angela. So I was happy to hear this, but not surprised. Um, I could see from the first time I saw you together that you work well together. Um, it was no surprise as well when one of James's college professors told me how he always worked hard and never complained. Sometimes we both had different ideas on how to run a business. You can ask the chickens. <laughs> but James has always been the kind of person to make sure that something is done well. And I can see that in the way that you love Angela and by putting God at the center of your relationship. Um, you both set a good example for those around you and I'm excited to see what the future holds for you both. It goes without saying that it feels strange to be here today without our dad and grandpa, but I know I can speak for them when I say that they, along with everyone else, are very proud of you both, and we all are. So we will miss you in Kentucky, but I know that God has big plans for you as you start your life together in Texas. So congrats again and best wishes, and I love you. I have been privileged to be Angela's sister for the last 22 years. And I would love to share some fun stories uh, and talk a little bit about um, having the privilege to witness these two and their relationship bloom and flourish, and here we are. So, for the last year, Angela will always come into my room and say, Brooke, so. How does it feel? I'm going to be married. And it's like, OK, sis, like, yeah, that's cool. Like, you beat me to the punch. Like, <laughs> it's awesome. I love James. <laughs> and it's like, cool, sis. I'm home for the summer. Let's go out and dance. And she's like, oh, I'm actually going out with James. I'm like, oh, cool, cool, cool. So I'm losing my partner, but it's fine. I like James. I like James. Um, so Angela, again. She's been asking me the last few days, how does it feel, Brooke? I'm going to be married. And it's really hard to put these giant emotions kind of fumbling around in my brain into something precise to tell my sister how much I love her and how much I'm proud and how grateful I am that James is her partner. We have lots of cousins, like 11 girl cousins at least, and we're kind of wild. <laughs> um, we were all about the same age when we, or as we grew up together. And what we did, our parents don't know, but we would always go to the back bedroom of our grandparents' house, and we would throw down. Like, like this is how it worked. You like get to grandma and grandpa's, you make eye contact with the rest of the girls in the house, and it's time. So we all run to the back bedroom. And then you circle up. So every part of the wall has a girl on it, and you pretty much like <laughs> buck up. <laughs> and you'd have a timer, and you say, one, two, three, go. Two girls go in, <laughs> and you just get rowdy. You know, it was tender, it was goofy. We're, we're young, had a lot of energy. But Angela? No, no. Angela was the person on the sideline who you'd come back from a hot session and she'd be like rubbing your back. She's like, you got it. You good. You good. You know, like prepping you for the next session. And, and that was the first big lesson I learned from my sister um, who is younger than me. And I just want to share, James, that Angela will be the greatest support system. Angela, being four years younger than me, I had the big sister persona, um, where like I'm supposed to be the leader, the teacher, and I'm a little bit more outspoken. And Angela has so much tenderness. And as we grew up together, um, <laughs> 
it was never a fight between us. Uh, but eventually, when I did grow older and maybe had a disagreement with someone in the family, she's very wise and is able to, for me, it would be maybe a soft rebuke or a redirection. Um, but it takes listening to Angela and giving her that space. And so I know you will, James, because I think she's met her match. I really got to see James and Angela and the light that they reflect to each other and from each other. And I'm just so grateful to, to bear witness to all of that. Um, before I hand over the mic, um, I would like to pass some advice over to you, James, as Angela's OG partner. Um, we've been going through it for a little while, so I hope I have a few things that are our keepers. Uh, but number one, Angela is a great dancer. Never, ever, ever say no. If you don't know how to move, it's OK. She makes anyone look good. Um, <laughs> so I'd love to see that tonight. Number two, um, not only will she be a wife, you know, in this, she's a great dancer, but she's also a great musician. So invest in a piano. She will pay you back in many, many serenades. And the last thing I've learned about Angela is how beautifully she balances strength and grace. And sis, you are a pillar of that that I've always admired and hope to emulate. Um, there's a quote that says, like a crystal um, at every angle, uh, a new gleam of light appears. And I've got to witness that as Angela's orbited through life. And from what I hear and have seen of James and your tenderness, James, um, helping mow lawns or helping with your father, your grandfather. I know Angela um, has met her, her perfect match. <laughs> <laughs>